Welcome back, Bartonella buddies. By the way, you don't have to have Bartonellosis to be my Bartonella buddy. On this channel, I talk about lots of things like SIBO and MCAS. So if you don't have Bartonellosis, don't worry, I have enough Bartonella for the both of us. Hashtag not sponsored, but it totally matches. First, I wanna say that I know it can be super annoying when people say they have fixed or cured their chronic illness and when you finally find out what their magic bullet is and you realize you've already tried it and it wasn't so magic for you, you may feel like rolling your eyes. Just drink salary water and all your problems will go away. <sighs> I realized that what I did was tailored only to me and may not work for everyone or even most. In November of 2020, I did my first Trio Smart breath test, and this is the only SIBO breath test available on the market currently. That tests for all three gases, so hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and methane. This video is going to build off of my previous videos on this topic, so if you haven't watched those, I'm going to put them in the video description box down below. So here are my results prior to treating. As you can see, my hydrogen result is negative because it did not rise 20 parts per million above baseline within the first 90 minutes. This is the North American consensus on hydrogen breath testing results using lactulose. My baseline started at 9.3 and rose to 12.57, so that's a rise of just above three parts per million. According to the North American consensus, a negative result for methane is under 10 parts per million, and mine was negative with a result of 0.85. And finally, a normal result for hydrogen sulfide is under 5, and my highest result was 10, which is also the highest that the test goes to, and I know this because I called the lab. My H2S is bigger than your H2S. Yeah, that ye! Skirt, skirt! I think in my previous life, I was a bro. Prior to treating, I developed extreme sulfur sensitivity to all sulfur-containing foods, including meat and cruciferous vegetables, which left me with these five foods. Over the course of the next several months, I started to become increasingly more and more reactive, and I started reacting to things that I had never reacted to before, like tampons and soap. I originally attributed it to exosomes therapy because I had nothing else to attribute it to, and I have several videos on that. But looking back now, I really think that most or all of my increasing reactivity was due to the hydrogen sulfide SIBO. Over the course of a weekend, my bladder pain increased significantly out of nowhere. I started to react to all of my safe foods, all of my safe medications, and water. And I don't know if you know this, but humans need water. I figured out I was literally reacting to the process of ingesting and immediately began Zyfaxin. I found a clinical trial online where Dr. Pimentel is treating IBSD or diarrhea with 200 milligrams of Zyfaxin and 600 milligrams of N-acetylcysteine or NAC. Now it's not clear from the clinical trial page how often that dosage is. Is it 200 milligrams of Zyfaxin once, twice, or thrice daily? And is it 600 milligrams of NAC total in a day or what? If you're in this clinical trial and you want to drop me a DM to let me know what it is, I will not tell on you. I will leave a link in the video description box to the clinical trial page in case you can find the dosage because I can't, because but it doesn't really seem to be there. It also doesn't say when they're taking the Zyfaxin and the NAC. Are they taking them at the same time? Are they taking the NAC a few hours before the Zyfaxin? I don't know. Once again, if you're in the trial and you want to DM me, you know where to find me. So why is the NAC important? Well, the NAC works as a mucolytic. So if you break... <laughs> Uh, it was just a demonstration. Speaking of mucus, I one time had this viral infection and my mom took this video of me snoring. We were on a trip together, so we were in the same room and she woke me up and she was like, Jake, I'm scared because of the noises I was making. I feel like you were partially asleep. Uh, no. But you weren't like, Jake, you're snoring. I'm scared. You were I like, didn't even know it was snoring. It was... <laughs> was so insane. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I could have used a mucolytic. If you break down the word mucolytic, the muco stands for mucus and the lytic means destruction. In the detailed description of the clinical trial, the researchers write that cyfaxin is not soluble in mucus and therefore can't reach the microbes there. The researchers hypothesize that the NAC will solubilize the zyfaxin and liquefy the mucus later, which will help the zyfaxin reach those microbes. The clinical trial will be comparing zyfaxin and NAC to zyfaxin and placebo to test two parameters. One, to see if the NAC allows for the zyfaxin dosage to be lowered, and two, to test if the NAC helps improve the efficacy of zyfaxin. Dr. Pimentel has been hinting that there are promising new therapies on the way, but he can't say what those are or else he can't publish. So I hypothesize that this mucolytic component is part of what he's hinting at. Zyfaxin works about 44% of the time in those with IBSD, and Zyfaxin works better than placebo, but 44%, uh, let's just say uh, that would get you in an F on your paper. Also, among patients that do respond to this drug, only 36% of them can get away with only doing one round. Dr. Pimentel and his team has shown that the major offenders in SIBO are E. coli and Klebsiella. And so while Zyfaxin is highly effective against these microbes, most of the E. coli is actually sitting in that mucus layer. Dr. Pimentel and his team were the first to show that the microbiome of the small intestinal lumen, which is tested by taking an aspirate, and the microbiome of that mucus layer, which is tested by taking a biopsy, are st statistically significantly different. Of course, there are other reasons why SIBO patients relapse other than the mucus layer, but I figured if this component of treatment was compelling enough for Dr. Pimentel and his team to run a clinical trial on, it sure as hell was compelling enough for me to run my own little experiment on my guinea pig body. It must be noted that NAC is a sulfuric compound and it may cause trouble in those who are sulfur sensitive or have hydrogen sulfide SIBO like me. So instead of NAC, my doctor suggested that I try a low dose of food grade diatomaceous earth. For those of you who don't know, diatomaceous earth is made up of soft sedimentary rock made of silica and it also contains the fossilized remains of diatoms, which are a type of hard shelled microscopic algae. A lot of alternative health websites make a lot of claims about diatomaceous earth, and so I'm not going towards that controversy. It's outside the scope of this video. However, it is thought to act as a mild abrasive at low doses in the GI tract, and so that might be a non-sulfuric option for a mucolytic. Diatomaceous earth, or DE, comes in food grade and not food grade. Don't ingest the non-food grade diatomaceous earth. I'm also not telling you to ingest the food grade diatomaceous earth because this isn't medical advice, but I will tell you what I took. Keep in mind that this is very individualized because I have very severe MCAS, so the starting and stopping was just based on what I thought was best for me and my body and it was not dictated by any of my practitioners. So I started with 550 milligrams of Zyfaxin twice a day for four days. On the fourth day, I took half a teaspoon of diatomaceous earth twice a day and shat a shit ton. On the fifth day, I only took a quarter teaspoon of diatomaceous earth once a day, and I switched over to one Zyfaxin a day because of increased MCAS reactivity. That day, I ran a low-grade fever for about an hour, and so that appears to be a die-off or a Yerish Herxheimer or Herx reaction. I kid you not, in just a few days, my bladder pain was decreased significantly, and now I would say my bladder pain is 95 to 100% back to normal. The Zyfaxin was like, you're in luck. And remember, I was at the point where I couldn't eat, take any of my safe medications, or even drink water without nerve pain? Well, the treatment brought me all the way back off that ledge, back down to baseline. I did say in my previous video that my bloating was almost completely gone, but I lied. I didn't mean to lie, I just spoke too soon, and you know, you can have bloating from MCAS alone sans SIBO, but the bloating is better, for sure. Over the next few weeks, I took Zyfaxin, low-dose DE, and then I added in a little bit of NAC, and even though I have my extreme sulfur sensitivity, I was able to tolerate a little bit of NAC, and I think being on a low-sulfur diet helped me tolerate the NAC as well. 
So my general pattern looked like this. So I would take one Zymaxin each day, and then I would alternate days of taking a mucolytic and not taking a mucolytic, and then I would alternate between those two mucolytics. When I started to get too reactive with my MCAS, I would take a short break for about two days, and then I would restart. So all in all, I took about 32 pills of Zyfaxin within a month. I redid the trio breath test in January, and here are my results. My hydrogen was considered negative because it did not rise 20 parts per million above baseline in the first 90 minutes. My baseline started at around 36 and rose to around 52, which is an increase of about 16. According to the North American consensus, my mouth is really dry. That's what they all uh, came to agree upon. <laughs> I need water. We strongly agree that Jake Picker's mouth is very dry. According to the North American consensus, the interpretation of results that start with a baseline above 20 parts per million, like mine, are unclear. Further studies are needed to determine whether elevated hydrogen baseline is indicative of bad test prep in terms of adhering to the diet the day before and slash or making sure one fasts for eight to 12 hours prior or rather it is indeed a SIBO variant. My doctor feels strongly that my hydrogen results were not good. Due to only being able to tolerate five foods, I obviously can't do test prep as indicated, but that's why I made sure to fast for 12 hours. And I did the exact same test prep as I did for the first test. And as I said in the beginning of the video, the baseline was nine and I only rose by three. So I'm leaning towards my GI doctor's opinion that that hydrogen result is not looking good. According to him, it's not uncommon for people with immune dysregulation like Bartonellosis and or MCAS to switch from one type of SIBO over to another. So on to my methane results. It was negative because my highest level was 0.68. And now the moment of truth. My hydrogen sulfide was normal with a value of 2.65. If I'm being honest, these results were both heartening and disappointing all at the same time. It's heartening in that I brought myself back to baseline from a very scary ledge, and it's heartening that my bladder isn't in constant nagging pain. It's heartening that it wasn't some brutal battle to get a negative hydrogen sulfide test, and it's heartening that I have had some improvement beyond baseline, that improvement being that I am more easily able to pass gas out of my ass. One day, one day, I could really, really, really pass gas for one day, one whole day. I really pass gas out of my ass for one day, one whole day. I pass gas out of my ass in mass for one day, one whole day. I pass gas out of my ass in class in mass <laughs> for one day, one day. I tried not to be crass and I failed miserably. The disappointing aspect is that I was hoping for more MCAS symptom resolution, especially with the hydrogen sulfide being much lower than it was and normal. However, it may be possible that my hydrogen baseline above 20 parts per million may be clinically relevant and may require more treatment, so I will keep you updated on that. It's also possible and maybe even probable that my MCAS symptoms may get better if I maintain SIBO remission over time. One of my Bartonella literate medical doctors has used this metaphor and I think it's beautiful. Treating Bartonellosis is like putting your foot on the gas. Gas pedal, not the other type of gas. When you're treating, you're driving up die off and you're driving up inflammation. And so when you stop treating, that's like taking your foot off the gas and the car still coasts for a while before coming to a complete halt. So now that I've taken my foot off the proverbial SIBO pedal, hopefully I can maintain remission and slowly the MCAS symptoms that were SIBO driven will calm down. I realized that I tested very shortly after stopping Zyfaxin, which is not what the North American consensus recommends. But you have to realize that I have a lot of puzzle pieces over here that not all SIBO patients have and each SIBO patient has different puzzle pieces. As of the filming of this video, I plan on monitoring my SIBO by doing the TRIO SMART breath test monthly. And with my comorbid conditions of Bartonellosis, MCAS, and having anti-vinculin antibodies, this means that a relapse of SIBO is quite likely for me. 
And I also realized that the clinical trial of pimentels that I referred to earlier is only on IBSD and hydrogen and makes no mention of hydrogen sulfide. But I really do think that mucolytics are key, not only for hydrogen, but also perhaps for methane and hydrogen sulfide as well. If we revisit pimentel's rabbit and predator metaphor, the hydrogen sulfide and the methane are the coyotes and wolves, and the hydrogen are the rabbits. Well, if you kill those rabbits that are hiding in the mucus bushes, the coyotes and wolves go hungry and die. Hopefully before you do, or I do. I will make future videos on hydrogen sulfide treatment because what I did will not work for everyone and maybe not even most. I will also make future videos on methods of maintaining SIBO remission, including on prokinetics and some of my experiences with them. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so that you're notified when those videos go up. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and let me know in the comments what you think about mucolytics in terms of treating SIBO. And if you want to stay up to date on my health life, here are my social media handles. Piper says, don't let your struggles with treating SIBO take the wind out of your sails. Piper, was that a pun on passing gas? Bye, Bartonella buddies!